Hi, I'm Laura. Hi, I'm Deanne. Hello, I'm Philippe. Welcome to our Lyman Book Club. We are reading Queen's Play by Dorothy Dunnett, and we are going to focus this discussion on part four, chapter three. Um, I will lead the discussion, but before we jump into it, uh, Dee and Philippe, what were your reactions to this chapter? Hmm. Well, um, we do get an interesting sort of tete-a-tete with both of our uh, D'Aubany conspirators here. So Lyman has a meeting with Robin Stewart, which is very interesting and we'll speak about. And then he has a whole other kind of meeting with Una. A meeting is what they're uh, calling it these days. All that coming. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, but we finally get some truth to the, her motivations and why she's been doing the stuff she's doing, which is such an important bit of information that I'm glad I finally know. It sort of helps ground her as a character a little bit more for me. And I don't dislike her as much, but I'm still not really pleased with that scene. But we'll get there. Yeah, I I really liked all the character moments in this chapter. It was it was full of not just plot exposition, but, but character stuff. So I really liked that a lot. Um, and we'll get to the stuff when we get there, but it was, I really enjoyed the chapter. It was good. Oh, good. All right. Um, so let's just jump in. Um, we start off with another horrible rapey quote. Um, <laughs> Again, about I just yeah. wrote like what question mark question mark question mark like yeah. So if she makes a difficult condition um, for her dowry, um, and then it lists all these hilarious things that a woman might make up to list for her dowry, and then it ends with there is no fine for forcing these women. Uh, yeah. What? So I don't know if you guys have any thoughts around why this is here. Um, I still think it has to do with uh, maybe the parallel is more explicit now. Una, you need to rethink your assumptions just because something, you know, you agreed to it a long time ago doesn't mean that you're in the right position now. Yeah. Um, just because this was the rule in ancient Ireland doesn't mean it's okay. I don't know. Also, I think it maybe gives us some context for the fact that Cormac is abusing her as if like it's a normal thing because they thought so poorly of women. I, I don't know the history that well. Yeah, and I, I mean, clearly she has a very long standing relationship with Cormac. And this quote is sort of talking about like things that are not only ridiculous, but like some of them are like ridiculous and worthless. And so has she traded like for something worthless, because I mean, a dowry is sort of like a, a exchange for marriage, like a trade of goods or power for connection. And so has she traded something for something worthless? I don't know. But then you get the whole rapey part of it, which is just gross. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think it's part of it is about their the sort of trade that they make in bed, where she comes out with. I'll tell you what you want for 5,000 Frenchmen out of Scotland, which is impossible. Um, and maybe also there's a parallel, interesting that you said the thing about these are impossible to get a hold of things, but also things that don't have any value, which reminds me of her line that they're both traitors in snow. Yeah. Which Sibylla said. I mean, so yeah. Um, okay, so let's jump in. So um, we start out actually kind of with a big picture view of the English Ambassage Extraordinary uh, of 300 arriving. Um, and this includes uh, the Earl and Countess of Lennox. Um, and they're here um, because England and Scotland or England and France are uh, making peace. Um, but in particular, we find out that the Lennoxes have been brought along as the potential fall guys uh, if this plot comes out and is associated with Warwick to protect him they will take the blame instead and they are probably aware uh, of that. I'm sure they're aware of that yeah yeah well it says Lennox himself was in no doubt presumably about the situation 
but was in no case to protest. Yeah. Also, there are too many Elizabeths and too many Marys in this whole situation because <laughs> I got confused. Like when it says they are all these things they want to do, and one of them is to solicit the hand of the king's daughter Elizabeth instead. They mean Henri's daughter Elizabeth, right? Yeah. Okay. Because I was like, uh, he's not going to marry his sister. What's the other Elizabeth? <laughs> There's too many Elizabeths and too many Marys. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so Margaret Lennox and Margaret Erskine is one of yeah. those examples because they're both real historical right. characters. So they have the same yeah. name, even though they're opposite characters. Like if, yeah. you were, if you were writing the book and you didn't have to go with the historical names, obviously you would not give them both the same name. Right. Well, there's, there's a page in this chapter where they're both mentioned and I had to read it several times to realize right. which Margaret was which. And I was like, wait, did we switch? When did yeah. that happen? Yeah. yeah. Yes, um, let's get cre more creative with our naming historical people. <laughs> that's also incestuous. They're all marrying their cousins and stuff. Yeah. Um, so then the part of this deal is that English have come in. They're going to ask for the hand of Mary, Queen of Scots, but they know they're not going to get it. So that's sort of expected. Um, and so also this quote at the beginning about asking something impossible for your dowry is about this, the, the asking for her hand, but they know they're not really going to get it. Right. Um, and we also get a little bit more about the tension between um, Scotland and France um, and this potential opportunity for England to step in um, because of uh, both sides being not so sure about this alliance. France is spending so much money on Scotland and the Scottish don't like having all these French in their fort. Right. And then the, the garter principal king at arms, the knight is nervous about carry like is I was a little bit confused by this trunk thing like is this gonna be something later where he's there's a whole paragraph about how he's nervous about taking this oh. very expensive trunk full of things with him to lore and it's like is the one gonna steal it later because <laughs> we have a random guy we've never heard of and a trunk of things we don't really care about. I, I also think it's probably her like painting the historical background and undoubtedly she found this information in a real historical source she's putting right. it in there to give us details about this and oh, okay. extraordinary. Like, is this trunk gonna come up again later? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows maybe it's the key to the plot. Um <laughs> Okay, so then we cut to Lyman, who is um, hanging out with his uh, fellow countrymen, mm -hmm. um, and we're in Robin Stewart's point of view, who is stalking him and planning to kill him, as he swore in the previous section that we read. Um, and we have him thinking, under the honest earth of Taddy Boy was someone's precious gallant quite alien to the uproarious creature of the hunt and the race. It made it, in a way, quite easy to kill the one without even touching the image of the other. Um, so he's got some weird stuff going on in his head. Yeah. <laughs> he's still in love with Taddy Boy a little bit, and he thinks he can kill Lyman for getting one over on him as Taddy Boy without harming the memory of Taddy Boy, who he still loves. Uh, like, dude, no. Um, I was, I, I, I thought this was so interesting as a, but he doesn't, he doesn't shoot him right away. So it's, it's like he's got to work himself up or he wants, he wants Lyman to be scared and know that he's going to die. So he shoots off to the side and then he shoots off to the other side and, and like, it's like, if he just shot him. <laughs> But he doesn't really want to kill yeah. him. He, he wants doesn't really him. want to kill him, exactly. But then he does shoot him, and if Lyman hadn't been wear wearing mail. I think Robin was going to kill him, but Robin is, yeah. is obviously not unconflicted about this whole thing. Right. Not a bit. Yeah, 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 he's very conflicted. Um, and, but he also wants him to know. Like, I think part of his, part of the conflict is that he doesn't just want to, like, shoot him in the back and have him die instantly. He wants him to know that I and it was Robin Stewart. Yeah. And so, yeah. I had assumed that's why he missed the first shot because Lyman sort of turns his head around and then the second shot comes just a bit later, even though it's Oh, no. Late. No, I think he, the first shot was very deliberately into the ground. Yeah, but, that's what I mean. He wasn't trying to hit him on the first time. Right, yeah, he wasn't trying to hit him. But he wanted to be like, turn around so you can see this arrow coming towards you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so then I think it's also 
pretty clear that Lyman, obviously he wants to talk to Robin Stewart because Robin's one of his sources of information. So he's basically walking around like, look at me, I'm bait. And he's wearing mail because he knows Robin's an archer. So he, this is exactly what he was trying to get uh, Robin to do. And of course, Robin, once again, just falls right into the trap that someone else manipulated him into. Because he really is. Yet again. And of course, the scene is set up so perfectly for this kind of thing to happen because they're sort of at this outdoor pastoral people in tents setting. So... I am really glad that the fact that he's an archer actually paid off. <laughs> the fact that he's been calling them the archers this whole time, and he really did end up shooting a bow and arrow. Like, yeah, like, and it, you, that, that worked. And that's how Lyman knew how to lure him and to keep himself safe by wearing mail. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. It's a good thing Robin didn't try to shoot him in the face or something. I know. It's also a good thing that Robin Stewart is shit at sword fighting. Well, also, I was actually a little bit intrigued by this because, so he's shooting a longbow, right? He says that, like in, so. like an English longbow, which yeah. can actually, like, an arrow can go, like, a male isn't actually defense against that. Like, an English longbow is super strong and can go through mail. So, Frank so I feel like actually, like, he was protected, but he wasn't, Robin could have still killed him. If you yeah. Was, yeah, like I feel like there was a whole long discussion about this on one of the mailing lists that I read years ago, and it was like there's two different kinds of mail, and one of the kinds of mail can protect you from it, but the other kind of mail can't. And so then the assumption was that Lyman was wearing the one that can. It's like a Maybe? different kind of mail. Yeah. Yeah, but like the English longbow is sort of famous for being like this incredible weapon that, like even today, there's not a lot that could protect you from it, and it's. Super, super powerful. And we certainly know that Lyman flees fast and loose with his own life. You also have to remember that the, the arrow that actually hits him, he was running towards. Right. Um, so I'm wondering if he was a lot closer. He was a lot closer, probably. And I don't think it was the perfect shot because Robin Stewart was sort of, oh, God, he's coming for me. I got to get this off. I can't really take the time to aim and make sure it's where exactly I want it to go. But it and hits him in the chest. Not full force either. He yeah, maybe not full force. Full. Yeah, he hits him. Yeah. Um, so I also, I like the excuse that Lyman gives to uh, go out because he's so charming. Um, but he, he basically, um, the quote he says is, the world is bored with me and I equally with it. I would prefer, forgive me, to promenade my bad humor alone. Um, so he's quite charming as he's like, I'm in a bad mood, so I'm going to go out alone. <laughs> so don't bother me. I'm going to go be grumpy outside. Yes. Like, uh, and also don't come outside because I'm about to get shot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and don't bother me because I need to be alone. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. so then they have this sword fight. Well, and well, and again, we can see that Lyman is leading him through the forest, and he even thinks, uh, you know, Robin. We're in Robin's point of view, led like a drumbeat by the crackling thud of Lyman's light feet. So he's making it. He's like making enough noise that Robin can stay after him. Um, and he also then in their sword fight, he starts thinking, oh, were you going to say that? I was just going to say, he's like, he's trying his hardest not to laugh the whole time. Right. He's like, oh, this is so cute. Robin's actually trying to kill me. And it's just <laughs> like, he doesn't realize that he's tried the same attack on me and I've defended it the same way all three times. And it's yeah. just something that it's not parryable. He says some sort of like specific so, defense. Robin's I so bad at... Like, it's interesting, this contrast between, like, he's clearly had a lot of training, and he knows what he's doing, sort of, in a lot of things, but he's been lazy about his training, and he hasn't taken the advice he should have taken, and he hasn't actually, he's trained so he's good enough up to a point, but then hasn't actually gone beyond that point, and Lyman is so, like, just rips him up one side or the other. It's almost like he's like his fighting teacher and it's like here's all the ways you failed in this assassination well, attempt and we know from the last book that Lyman is like the best swordsman in Scotland apparently <laughs> yeah yeah so it's like he was never Robin was never gonna win but Robin is also super delusional so we have all these thoughts um you know equally he supposed Lyman realized that this was the end the death of a herald could mean nothing to a man with nothing to lose and then later he thinks they were evenly matched and he who had nothing left on earth to fear had the stronger will of the two it's like right. no, you don't <laughs> mm -hmm. you don't and you're not equally matched either <sighs> like i sort of in this sword fight i i definitely had in my head the whole um 
I'm not left-handed from Oh, from Princess Bride. Bride. <laughs> you know? Like like obviously those two are much more equally matched in the Princess Bride sort of fight, but but that in this whole like I know something you don't know. I am not left-handed. It just kind of felt like that tone. Um so then uh, this couple comes out uh, dur during the sword fight and the woman is screaming uh, and they think, and Lyman basically makes up a thing about there was a man out here and then she's like, oh my God, it was my husband. And they play this whole yeah. scene. <laughs> my brother. Um, yeah, and, and he, he sends um, the guy off with his sword and he's like, I'll be fine. I don't need it. Take my sword. Um, which is all, uh, basically this was sort of like a coincidence that just made an even better version of the plan he already had. Mm -hmm. um, which was to get Robin alone to talk to him. So he's going to warn him out fighting and now they can have a conversation. And having disarmed himself, I think he has genuinely put himself in some degree of danger, although he's quite confident in his ability to defeat Robin. Robin does have a sword pointed right at him and he is unarmed. So a little risky, but he uh, he does it. Par for the course for Lyman. Like, that it's a calculated risk. risk. Yeah, it's a calculated risk, but of course he's going to take it because he does that kind of thing. Yes. Um, and, and well, and we hear later, it's, so it's a calculated risk, but uh, at least if we trust Robin's point of view, Lyman really doesn't know what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, right after the couple leaves, Lyman, alone in the moonlight, collapsed breathless onto the ferns, helpless with laughter. Why is he, he's just so amused in this whole thing? All right. Yeah, I mean, Part of it could just be like laughing from release of tension, you know, like sometimes we laugh not because things are uproariously funny, but because you have to release the tension and all that. So there could be some of that, but he also could be genuinely amused by like these. Well, the whole... couple coming out was really funny. Yeah, like that's funny. The, th the whole like Robin thinking he can beat him in a sword fight is kind of funny. Like, you know. Imagine having an affair in the woods in the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden these two men sword fighting come <laughs> in and work you. Because it was clearly an affair. The woman thought it was her husband. Yeah. They were they were getting up to no good in those woods. So. Uh -huh. Shenanigans. Um, so then um, Lyman, of course, who's 10 steps ahead of Robin, reveals to Robin that it was Diabony that helped him escape. And Diabony has basically let him out so that he could be the fall guy and connected him with this person who's going to kill him so that he can't talk um, once the murder is done. And Robin's like, no, that's not what happened. And of course, he totally, it totally <laughs> is. Um, and we actually get the name of being used. Yep. And we get the name of the guy, which is Andre Spence. We've heard that name before, right? I don't think my, my, so, but okay. maybe. Maybe I'm imagining it. Um, I also do like Robin's line, um, I forgot you were raised in a coven. <laughs> um, he's kind of talking about the magic Lyman's going to pull. Um, but yeah, I mean, so Lyman then basically has sort of like a rational conversation with him about what to do next. Like, you could kill me, you could turn yourself in, you could give me the information and then turn yourself in. Um, and Lyman basically gives the impression that he doesn't really care whether Robin kills him or not, but he does want him to, you know, help stop Daubeny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this line where when Stuart says, why didn't did you do as you did? And Lyman says, I owe you a little free will, said Lyman shortly. But I think it's, you know, it's a reference to all the manipulation he's done. The crossroads may, be not, may not be of your seeking, but at least the road you choose will be your own. And obviously that's a manipulation in and of itself, <laughs> but it's also a nice line. <laughs> like, yeah. But I think, I actually do think Robin is right. The Lyman could just take him in. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, uh, Robin's more right than he knows because Lyman could easily just take him in still just with one person, let alone with the two, um, and probably would be able to get him to talk. Mm -hmm. um, but Lyman, I think, genuinely wants to give him that moment of free will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is manipulative in that it's a nice thing to say, and it gives Robin some dignity, but it also gives Robin some dignity and gives him a moment, right? So do you think this was the right thing for Lyman to do? 
considering that it if he had just taken Robin in and got him to talk, maybe he wouldn't have had to go to Una. I do not think this was the simplest answer to this problem. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> I think it was a Lyman answer to the problem, but I don't think it was the simplest or easiest answer to the problem. Um, Lyman is never going to have the simple or easy answer to any problem. Like, this book would have been over on page 15 if if he'd done like the simple easy thing. So, so then we have um, Lyman basically said, you could kill me. He, Stuart asked him to take off his mail and he does. Stuart's in front of him with the blade. Um, Lyman doesn't know what he's going to do and he just sits there mm. and then Robin breaks down crying. Mm. <sighs> Poor Robin. I really kind of, even after all the shit that he's done in this book and this moment, you know, this, this, this whole bit till the end of their conversation, um, I just really like this part. Yeah. It's finally like, it's, it's, it's Lyman finally sitting down and telling Robin exactly what he's needed to hear all of his life. And while everybody's been saying these things behind his back to Robin, I don't think anybody has sort of sat down and been like, you can't just get these things. Mm -hmm. They don't just come to you. You have to apply yourself. Like, sure, you may be a royal archer, but like, these are professional matters. You have to be precise. You have to have polish. You have to carry polish and precision into everything you do. Like, and I don't think anyone has ever had this discussion with him before. People have just written him off his entire life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he definitely yeah. has needed a teacher. Mm -hmm. And just that he says, like, only lack of genius never held anyone back, said Lyman. Only wasted time on resentment and daydreaming can do that. You never did work with your whole brain and your whole body at being an archer. And just that. But we also find out about his, that his father was Yavni's uncle. And that if his mother had married his father, he would have been, like, according to bloodlines robin would have been the heir not not john stewart and so you can see where his his mind got all twisted up with that and understandably so and well and i think also this is where then we have the lyman parallel with like you could have had mid culture but for you know your your nephew and Lyman has the maturity to move on from it. But I think there was a real risk of him sinking into bitterness the way that Robin did. Mm -hmm. And it, like you said, it twisted his whole perception on life. Yeah. Um, so there's all of that. Yeah. Robin. Yeah. So there's, I think a very important and unattractive part of Lyman that we see in this sequence. Um, and it is on 390, about halfway down. Um, we're in Lyman's point of view on Robin, which is very rare to get Lyman's point of view, so it, it tells us it's important that we're getting it. Um, he thinks, there was nothing noble about the disheveled head sniveling harshly at his feet. After this show of cleansing emotions, Stuart would doubtless feel much restored. Um, and he's getting ready to speak, uh, Stuart, and Lyman thinks, it was going to be sentimental. The very cast of the mouth foretold it. The bloody fool could not realize even yet that anyone trained as Lyman was could have outplayed him, disarmed him, and manhandled him back to camp shirtless, swordless, and without intervention from half-naked young idiots with their mistresses or anybody else. Um, Lyman is super, super contemptuous mm -hmm. about Robin's deep and profound pain. Mm -hmm. um, Lyman is giving him free will, but he's still playing puppet master, and it's a very cold, um, like, rational kind of approach that he takes but he doesn't feel empathy he doesn't feel the, the true human compassion for this like deeply suffering person yeah well i kind of wonder when i read that if lyman like feels like this emotional outburst on robin's part has not been earned like why does he get to be so emotional and torn up and in pain when he hasn't done anything to like he's had no compassion for others he's had no like he he's all of his personal compassion is solely focused inward robbins and so the fact that lyman doesn't have compassion for him in this scene 
is both a character flaw, like he should have compassion for others, but also kind of understandable. Like, you know. I think it's understandable. Like, I, I love Lyman. I'm not like, wow, he's the worst person ever. But I do think it's a flaw in his yeah. thinking. Yeah. Because this is this is the core of this, like, broken mm -hmm. person, broken soul, and revealed probably for the first time ever. And Lyman is just like, oh, oh I'm sure he'll feel better after he cries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pathetic sniveling, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um... Okay, can we please talk about this? I do not understand what's happening halfway down 392. Like, why Lyman hits Robin, the oh. insult that he gives. I Is he saying that, yes, Sib that he's not legitimate, that Sibylla slept with someone? Because then I don't get his reference to his grandfather. Like, that's the part that confused me. Okay, Mike. My conspiracy addled brain went crazy over this part. Okay, what do you think? Because I was going in like 12 different directions. I think, because we know that Dorothy Dunnett doesn't throw anything in just for no reason right. at all. There's a very specific right. reason. This is the first time we're hearing rumors of this. I think that Robin is implying that either Lyman or Richard is illegitimate. I think Lyman is, Ill I think she's implying that Lyman's illegitimate. But... But here's where I got confused. Okay, so, uh, da da da, he'll be Neil. Um, okay, uh, where are we? Oh, Liam Rowe. Okay, by the time, da da da, he'll be kneeling. You're, you're gay and unsympathetic with bastardy, aren't you, man? Gay and willing to let us crawl over the clean floors until our manners have been trimmed. What does Richard Coulter say to that? So, bringing Richard into it. So, maybe Richard, too? I don't know silence then to what said Lyman quietly so I think indication that this has hit a bone like oh uh, yeah <laughs> yeah so it's that, Lyman's not laughing yeah. anymore yeah yeah so what does Richard Coulter say to that to the habits of his famous grandfather so that's Lyman's grandfather so that would be his father's father okay so by all accounts a grand family man if a mite careless where he slept Okay, so his grandfather's sleeping around. All right. How yeah. does his lordship enjoy, unless he means the baby's grandfather, which would be Lyman's father, right? Unless he means Kevin's grandfather. Well, the famous grandfather was- Richard's um, grandfather. Yeah, Richard and Lyman's grandfather. Okay, so their grandfather sleeps around and I'm kind of like, okay, so what? which brings light to something the Dame de Dutin said. She was like, I knew your grandfather. Right. right, she said that earlier, she knew his grandfather, right. So his grandfather was sort of a playboy, like, okay. By so, all accounts, the grandfather, uh, my coach, so how does his lordship enjoy all the rumors? Okay, so at that point, I'm like, okay, so the grandfather sleeps around, big deal. Like maybe his father was illegitimate, but then who really cares? His father's dead, the grandfather's dead, like what's the point? So Lyman rose, not quite as tall as the archer. He had a voice which cut the space between them to ribbons. What rumor, Stuart? The archer, fleering, fleering, by the way, no. No. <laughs> did not answer correct. I was like, that's a new word. <laughs> did not answer directly. The new heir to the titles cried, Kevin, is he not? I heard the Erskine woman talk of it once. The old lady, meaning Sibylla, wouldn't have Francis and she wouldn't have it after your da. So she wouldn't have Francis and she wouldn't have whatever his dad's name is. I forgot. Gavin. Um, Gavin. 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 You can understand it right enough. Okay, so she didn't want the baby named after Francis because Francis is illegitimate. Like, I don't get the point, basically. I don't or maybe named after Gavin because Gavin was illegitimate because, or because the Gavin slept, slept, around. A, slept around, but then that wouldn't make Francis illegitimate because um, it means Sibylla slept around. Like, like I understand that Lyman is upset, but I don't understand what specifically Robin is trying to say.
you well, don't do you... want to say anything, do you? <laughs> it's, really, it's really hard to say anything. I have a definite feeling that this is this is hitting on something and it will come back around. Right. Obviously it is, but I guess my confusion is either this is a rumor that Lyman has heard before, so he knows what what Robin is implying, or I don't understand what Robin is saying. <laughs> like from this I language, what is Robin saying? Do you, um, do you know what the famous grandfather was named? No. Do we? Are we supposed to? Are we supposed to? I don't remember. I, I, don't, I don't remember if you're supposed to know yet. Is it another? Is it Francis? Is it Francis? Yeah, that's what I was going to guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it could be an implication that Richard's illegitimate if he won't if Sibylla won't allow him to name his son after the legitimate first baron. I mean, obviously he's legitimate. He was the first baron. Or it could be that Lyman is illegitimate and Sibylla doesn't want the genuine heir named after a bastard. But neither of those track with what I feel we know about Sibylla. Like, I don't think she would care about either of those things. Like, I think she loves her son's and naming the heir after Francis or Gavin would like only only cement his legitimacy in the eyes of the public, not uncement it. So then the only thing I can think of is does Sibylla think Kevin's illegitimate? Like, <laughs> like which that seems like nonsense. So Oh, I have all sorts of questions yeah. now. Like, obviously, well, this is something, but... Yeah. Like, now I'm trying to figure out in my hand if the Dame de Dutance is secret grandmother or something. Because did she sleep with the grandfather? Is she actually somebody's mother that we don't know about? I mean, it is pretty weird that she took in this guy that she just met and protected him from the law that was coming after him. And she right. knows both his grandfather and Sibylla well, well enough to say. Right. But I still don't... I still just feel like... Robin is trying to imply that Sibylla did something unkind with this naming thing. Like that somehow Sibylla did something by not allowing the child to be named Francis or Gavin, somehow that would make Francis Crawford look bad. And it's like, I don't think Sibylla would do that. Well, then that might not be what's going on here. Mm. Um, I think you oh god okay so if that's not going on here then I feel like am I so here's my question I guess am I not understanding this because I'm reading it wrong or am I not understanding this because I don't have some information yet I would probably assume the second because it is confusing I think that there is right I'm not wrong about that right it's super confusing mm. Yeah, it is confusing, and I think it's it's just a hint at something we know nothing of yet. That's what I would assume, and that's how I took it to be. Okay. In which case, Laura, maybe you don't want to answer that question. I don't know. I mean, I don't want you to give us information that we don't have, but I would like you to give us information that we do have. Like, are we supposed uh, to have information here that we're not figuring out? Um, no, you're there's there uh, there's one slight hint of this in Game of Kings, but I can't remember exactly what it was right now, but it basically comes down to Lyman and Richard are very different. Um, and right. I can tell you that when I first read this, I interpreted it as a suggestion that either Richard is a bastard or Lyman is a bastard, yeah. one of them. Right. Um, I but I wasn't sure which. Kings. I remember that from Game of the Kings where there was this implication that like physically they look so different. Yeah. And there's, there's, but there's a whole thing. If I remember correctly, there's this, there's this section in Game of Kings where it talks about how Richard looks like his father and Lyman looks like his mother. And there was this, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't explicitly saying that Lyman was illegitimate because he doesn't look like his father. He only looks like his mother but you could have read it that way. So I also think it's extremely telling that Lyman su has such an intense 
reaction that mm -hmm. despite being completely calm throughout this entire scene, right. including when he's about to, when he could easily be killed, he's totally chill. But then when Robin says this, he flips his shit. Right. Obviously it's something like clearly, and it clearly has something to do with somebody being a bastard because that's what Robin says. Like, are you so upset about bastardy and then goes into this comment so clearly that's what's going on i just don't understand the whole grandfather thing like why is that important because that's two generations back three generations back if you're counting kevin and it's kind of like who cares they're all like uh, at the this point like let's say let's say gavin was a bastard okay so that means the line of Coulter goes through somewhere else but does that practically and functionally matter at this point no, no and that wouldn't that wouldn't cause that extreme emotional reaction no. the extreme no. emotional reaction is about the implication that either Richard or Lyman is a bastard with maybe your sort of like outlying possibility that Kevin could be a bastard which I don't it's, think that's true either like no. that's ridiculous it, I just I just I'm like why bring the grandfather into it at all I'm super confused by that I think that's what's confusing me so much. If that if that part of the comment wasn't in it, then it would be like, oh, he's implying Lyman's a bastard, and that really ticked him off. And you know, obviously that rumor has been floating around, and Lyman's sensitive about it, and he's yeah. it's him and knocks Maybe him off. Just to show that it's sort of a rumor that has tracked their family throughout the ages now. Maybe. <laughs> why do you think? Why do you think Lyman has such an extreme reaction to it? Because he's probably heard it before. And maybe because the way that he and his brother are so different, even if he doesn't know, he's thought about it in the past, perhaps. Well, and it says something super terrible about his mother. Yeah. Like, socially, that would be yeah. like hugely, hugely terrible. But I would say that a person would not have such an extreme emotional reaction to something like that if they weren't somewhere deep inside afraid that it might be true. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I completely agree. A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of other interesting things in this um, that I want to highlight. Um, one is when Robin goes off about John Stewart of Albany and then sort of puts Lyman in the same bucket as um, you treat life, all of you, as if the world was a tilting ground. Um, meaning, you know, you treat life like a game. Um, and I think this is a sort of a parallel with oh, Liam Rowe saying that um, Lyman treats people like puppets, you know, like their lives are, are just part of a game, which is how Daubeny is. It's not entirely how Lyman is. He has a good intention, but there is some, some truth in this. Mm -hmm. um, and we think of the previous page where Lyman is, you know, thinking so contemptuously toward Robin. Mm -hmm. um, it is kind of like he's just using him yeah um so i also think when lyman gives that whole lecture to robin about you know your, your hair is messy and your stockings and blah blah blah, blah mm -hmm. um it's definitely like his own philosophy now as river vassal certainly it wasn't as tatty boy but um this is what he's doing he's embraced this philosophy of doing everything meticulously perfect um and I think we'll see, we'll continue to see this in Lyman's behavior, right? Because it wasn't actually entirely true in Game of Kings. Sometimes he was sloppy and drunk and messy and had food and drink, whatever. But like, he's he's really now into this super like rigid um, perfection. Yeah. I also um, kind of see this whole scene that he's had with Robert and Stewart as him being the most himself in this book that he has been. He's neither Taddy Boy nor Vervassal right now. He's like, He's the Francis that I sort of remember. And it's it's almost like he's, all of this has come too late. Like this mm -hmm. entire conversation could have been useful to Robin, you know, six months ago. But it's it's the tragedy of this, of this relationship between the two of them is that Lyman had this all along. Like he had the ability to say this all along and he didn't. And if he had, there could have been a different outcome. Mm -hmm. and That's a good point. Sort of breaks my heart a little bit at the top yeah. of 392 when he says, I wish you would come to me five years ago. Like yeah. just the different way things could have turned out, possibly for even Lyman in that case. 
You know? yeah, and, and all this, like, you would have hated me as you do now, but the Stuarts might have found, found themselves with a man. Because Robin is a Stuart. You know, like, he's a Stuart in, and he could have, like, this, it, on multiple levels, it could have been good. Like, he could have been, if, Ro if Lyman had mentored him five years ago, Robin could have been a benefit to the Stuart family that would then also have benefited Lyman, mm. like, in... Yeah. So I think also very interesting following that exchange is, uh, you know, Robin's like, you know, a man created by you. And Lyman says, you don't need to excel at anything in order to teach, which is kind of like deferring his own extreme capabilities because he actually is good at everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then Robin says, except hypocrisy. You taught me to respect you and all the time you were a spy. Uh, what did you teach Liam Rowe? I noticed he shaved. So this is the same thing that Liam Rowe was thinking about Lyman in the beginning of this section, a hypocrite he wanted to see chastened. Um, Robin now is also calling him a hypocrite. Um, and when he is calling him a hypocrite, that's when he brings up the bastardry thing. Because um, we get this, like we were saying before, this extreme depth of pathos from Robin Stewart, this core devastating thing in his soul is that this bastardry issue with himself and Ro and Lyman has no empathy for him. But then when he turns it on Lyman, Lyman freaks out. Mm -hmm. um, so he actually is kind of hypocritical here because yeah. he has this extreme reaction to something that he did not forgive Robin's extreme reaction to. Right, right. right. But I think Robin is wrong that like, I don't think when he says uh, you're unsympathetic with bastardy, aren't you? I, that's not what Lyman is unsympathetic about Robin for. It's not that he's a bastard. Like, But he was unsympathetic yeah. to his whole breakdown. Right, 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 right. But Robin, I think Robin has this chip on his shoulder about I'm a bastard and everyone is judging me for that thing. And that's not the thing that people are necessarily judging him by. I mean, some people probably are, but but like there's a whole bunch of other things that he's doing that he's actually getting judged for. It's not that. But you're right that that issue clearly has huge resonance for Lyman. So I mean, I absolutely love Lyman. I also think he's being careless with Robin's soul here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I wish he just took him a little bit more seriously because no matter how dumb and clueless and like awful he is, mm -hmm. the depth of his suffering is real and true and deserving of some empathy. Yeah. And there's been multiple points in the story where it's been pointed out that he does have a core that was worth saving. Like that there was that there, if things had happened in his life, if people had mentored him if he had been able to find a teacher, like that he could have been worthy and, and you know, valuable and, and all that. And so, yeah. Um, so then I guess one kind thing Lyman does here is that he actually goes and finds uh, not only the sword, but the bow that Robin had dropped in the woods and puts them beside him so that when he wakes up from being knocked out by Lyman, um, he has them there with him, mm -hmm. um, which I, do think Lyman gets a little bit of credit for. He is trying to give Robin a chance at making the right choice. Um, and then we end with Robin uh, pressing his fist to his face and cursing Francis Crawford with hate and yearning raw in his voice. Yeah. Um, when we were talking about his mixed feelings earlier, hate and yearning, what a combination. Right. Yeah. I get it though. All right. Any other final comments on that section? It was good. Yeah. It was good. All right. Um, so we cut to Chateaubriand uh, Palace. Um, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> blah. Blah. Like people <laughs> doing some stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, what, what we get, it gets interesting when we get into O'Leam Rowe. Um, his feelings towards Francis Crawford were still close to bitter, but he could not bring himself to see him denounced or something he did not do. Um, so much bitterness, right? We get a bitter Lyman twice in the last few chapters. Robin's always bitter. Dobbin, bitter. Una's bitter. Now even O'Leam Rowe's bitter. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so then Olyamro goes to visit Mary, Queen of Scots, who has a new governess because Jenny Fliving is gone. I'm sure Dee is really happy about that. <laughs> that one. Um, and he comes in this adorable scene of Lyman in there with Mary, Queen of Scots, and they're playing this they're playing this like counting game with with a like, little song. That was one of the things that I wanted. I think I remember when you were saying like, what are things you want? One of the things I wanted was for Lyman and Mary to have a connection in the scene after he had rebuffed her. Mm. Um, so I was glad to see this. And we get reminded yet again that Lyman is so good with kids. It's so adorable. I think um, in heaven. I hope they have some good scenes. Um, so die or something like what? <laughs> I said Kevin will probably die or something. It'll probably be some like horrible thing that no. Lyman for two books or whatever. That Maybe would be Lyman will have kids. By the way, I hope that that's not true. Maybe Lyman will have children before the end of this thing is over. That would be cool. That would be cool. If he has, if he can stay alive long enough for him. I don't know though. If he had kids, I feel like it would just stop his life because he would just protect his kids. Like, well, maybe that's how the whole thing ends. He wouldn't go like traipsing off and doing things. Yeah, that's true. Happy ending. He has kids, so he has to stop all the <laughs> espionage. Nice. What would he maybe be like with, as a father? Maybe with um, <laughs> Philippa. <laughs> maybe. I'm still not giving that up. <laughs> I want, Kate with to Una. Be, I want Kate to be his mother-in-law. No, actually, I know I it won't be with Una. I'm, so. I'm willing it to happen. I just want it to happen. I well, think you're shipping a character that was in, like, one scene in the previous book. I don't know. I don't care. And she's too young. Like, she can't. It's not possible. She's 10. She's not. Well, she's, like, 12 now, but it's still, she's still too young. Um, yeah. Oh, God. Okay. Okay. So things and don't let them go. <laughs> oh no. It's good that you're shifting something. <laughs> um, so after this very sweet scene, Lyman comes out and talks to Oliamro and uh, he's on his way to see Una and Oliamro asks if there's anything he can do to stop him and Lyman, his face closed hard and he says, go in there and then ask me again. So you do get some sense that Lyman is not just doing this for the nation of Scotland. He also genuinely cares about Mary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he can't find Una, which he assumes is because uh, Mistress Boyle is keeping her hidden, which makes sense because they could probably guess that he's going to come looking for her. Mm -hmm. um, and he tells Oliamro that he talked to Robin and let him go, which of course does not make Oliamro happy because he's basically like, you're sacrificing Una in favor of Robin, really? Mm -hmm. And I love Lyman. It's like, I hope, said Lyman not to sacrifice anybody. And you just feel like that's a vain hope. Like, I don't think he's gonna make it to the end of the book with that, <laughs> with that. you know? It's like, oh, that's really admirable that he says that, but I don't know if that's gonna be possible. Well, remember back to his conversation with Margaret Erskine in the beginning, that part of the reason he wanted this no strings attached relationship was so he could just abandon it at any point because he really desperately doesn't want anyone to die on his watch again. Yeah. Um, so I do think there's a very wishful thinking thing with him here. Like, I'm going to save everybody. Yeah, I'm like, I don't know if you're going to be able to save everybody. And I also wonder if maybe part of the reason he let Robin go is because dying on the wheel is such a horrible way to die, and he doesn't want to be responsible for bringing him back to that. Um, do you think Oliamro knows that Lyman is intending to seduce Una? Mm -mm. I don't think so. I didn't think so either. I was reading in one of the mailing lists and someone said they thought that Oliamro knew, but I don't think so. I think it sounds like Lyman's just going to strong arm her. I think if Oliamro found out that Lyman was planning to seduce Una, that he wouldn't be surprised by it. Like, I think that he would take that piece of information and be like, oh, of course he's going to do that, you know? But I don't think he thinks that he's going to. I don't think he knows that he's going to. Yeah. Um. So then there's an interesting line here where Lyman <laughs> says, my dear Phelan, cease to worry. You know my tenets. The mind is the origin of all that is. The mind is the master. The mind is the cause. Um, and Oliam Miro says, try telling that to Cormac O'Connor. Um, do you think that's really Lyman's philosophy? Mm. It doesn't quite scan right to me. Yeah. 
I mean, part of that, but yeah, he is super smart, but I think he. No, I don't think so. I think he's more. Because I would say than... the mind is definitely one of his main sources that he uses, but he's also just friggin' lucky. <laughs> like a lot of his plans come off because of luck. It's and like as much plan as you can do. And because of improvisation and because yeah. of his like creativity. Right. He's creative and he understands people's passions. Like he can, he can, the reason he can manipulate people is because he understands what motivates people, which is usually not the mind. <laughs> like that's not, yeah. Normally people aren't thinking super logically about everything in their lives. <laughs> so I, I do think there's a possibility here that Lyman is embracing this philosophy as a reaction against his whole Tatty Boy experience. Like he's actually, I think he may not be bullshitting a Liam Rowe. I think he may genuinely be veering in this direction and convincing himself that I will deny all the needs of my body. I'm not drinking anymore. I'm, I, it's all that matters is the mind. Oh, I can see that. Yeah. That it's sort of like wish fulfillment. This is, this is my tenant, damn it. That all the yeah. mind is all. Yeah. Yeah. Because it probably scared him that he got so out of control. Yeah. I mean, I think that scene where he was stumbling around with the poison that whole night was terrifying. I think that came through really clearly. Yeah. yeah. Poor dear. Yeah. And then we get this lovely section where <laughs> Lyman is basically stalking Diabini. Yeah. <laughs> so great. Oh my God. And, and Diabini's like, Diabini's upset. Um, so he goes off and he like, he does, it literally calls it therapy. Yeah. Um, he goes and cheers himself up by buying some like it's random art. art. Yeah. And, and then it, Lyman's like, oh, this is a great piece of art. I've never seen better. <laughs> and it, and I love, I love um, his lordship with angry reluctance feasted on these tainted sweets. <laughs> <laughs> like you're my enemy, but you're complimenting my art. I can't help I it. just can't not take the compliment. <laughs> Like, uh, so funny which does speak to Diabni's like desperate need to be respected and thought of as like a cultural you know culturally knowledgeable and yeah it's tainted sweet <laughs> oh god okay so um of course is harkening back to the candy the actual tainted the sweets yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Which he can't resist, even though he knows this is his enemy. Yeah. Um, so then uh, we have Margaret Erskine observing Lyman. His eyes were clear, his movements resilient as a whip. What had cured his broken bones had mended. Clearly, the damage other things had done. So he is healthy and super capable and super good looking. And yay. And I wrote off to the side, really? Is he really completely better? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think he looks better, but. Yeah. Um, so he then appears um, and he is clearly going to the ball because he is perfumed and covered in jewels. Um, and I love George Douglas's little observation. Lady Lennox will worship you. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is where we switch from Margaret Erskine to Margaret Lennox without really mentioning it. I mean, it does say Matthew Stewart. Matthew Stewart Margaret's husband. Right. So now we know. Yeah. But still, I was like, oh, that was abrupt. So. so it is interesting here that we get that Lennox at this point wants nothing to do with the Mary Queen of Scots murder plot um, because it he and Margaret are already in a very precarious position being Catholics and Protestant England. And so um, he just wants to stay out of it and stay safe. Yeah. Yeah. He was, uh, yeah, he's like, f for since that first delicate conversation with Brother John long ago, he'd been horrified to notice how the sparks from the Diabni activities in France kept flying toward the Lennoxes in London. But you have to wonder if, like, Margaret is, because we've seen, like, Matthew's kind of dumb, you know, <laughs> and John is obviously easily manipulated as well. So the fact that Matthew is horrified by this doesn't necessarily mean that Margaret is horrified by it or that she's not part of, she might be horrified by the sparks flying back and the, the potential, the potential uh, I think, splash over onto them. But yeah, but she could still be manipulating John the whole time. I mean, I even think that first delicate conversation, it could have been that 
Matthew Stewart did want his brother to kill Mary, but he didn't realize his brother was going to do it in such an over-the-top, incompetent way Mm -hmm. that sends all these sparks flying in his direction. He thought it would be a delicate, subtle thing. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Since then, he'd been horrified to learn. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it could be he just didn't realize that his brother was so incompetent. (laughs) So terrible being an assassin. You tried to kill her with elephants and a cheetah? (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Really? Whatever (laughs) happened to poison? And that didn't work? (laughs) The stampede of elephants didn't work? The lamb coming out of the whale? The lamb coming out of the whale? Uh, and, and the and, cheetah, yeah, and that like losing a cheetah to a group of hunters to kill a uh-huh. kid that didn't work. Like, who would have thought? Uh, no, said Matthew Stewart briefly. I find John's passions a little irksome. <laughs> ah, the understatement. Uh, so then we have, um, we got George Douglas is the one talking to him, um, and He's sort of, um, sort of saying that, well, so Matthew calls Lyman a giddy gentleman who will carry a hod for anyone willing to pay. So this is another, like, he's just a whore for whoever you know, pays him. Mm-hmm. Um, and George says, I, for one, will applaud his first serious mistake. Um, and he also says, our friend is inflamed with presumption and pride. So I think George, like, is an interesting character because he helps Lyman sometimes, but he's also kind of cheering for his downfall. Um, not on his side. Not, he's not on his side, but I think he doesn't necessarily want him gone because he's still looking for his end to be able to use him for his own ends. I think he finds him valuable at times, and so, yeah. George um, seems to be the only one of this group of Stuart men who has this, is, like, savvy in any way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And notably, he's related by blood to Margaret, so I guess the, the brains run uh, mm-hmm. in that side. Inside the family. Yeah. Um, so then he, they also talk about, um, I'm sure Margaret uh, uh, will help. Will, I, I should even trust her to help him make it, meaning a mistake. Um, and George says, I should say, in which case I should say more power to her elbow, which I was like, what the hell does that mean? Yeah, I didn't get so, that. So our English viewers, I guess, will know this. That is an English expression that means something like good for her. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. All right. But then there's a thing about the hesitation between one word and the next was fractional. So like he wasn't going to say elbow, which I think is some sort of sexual implication. Yeah, because then Matthew gets mad, like his face turns pale and he gets, yeah. And so make the more informed bystanders wince. So people were overhearing them and whatever implication he made was well known like this this implication of Lyman and Margaret having an inappropriate sexual relationship is pretty well known, obviously, if random people standing beside them are like, ooh, that. that this is definitely is. that, this is that, uh, definitely that, like, sensitive point where if you poke it, you know, Matthew Lennox is like, ah! Yeah. And, and I mean, he's, public. <laughs> and he's not wrong that his wife still has this, like, lust toward Lyman, even though she totally also wants to kill him. Yeah. Um, so then we have this wonderful description of the ball. We go to the ball. Mm-hmm. I want to go to this ball. I really do. Too. I, for, for some reason, I, oh, yes. For some reason, <laughs> this ball reminds me of the ball in Labyrinth when David Bowie and Jennifer Connelly are dancing. Yeah. Um, and then um, we've got the pages brought garlands of flowers and wine and wicker baskets filled with cat masks. And I love this idea that they're wearing cat masks because Lyman and Una are... Um, they're both described as cat-like at points, and they both wear masks all the time to hide who they really are. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's this perfect motif of yeah. the two of them. And then we get um, this super gross conversation with O'Connor. So with O'Connor? With the Earl of... No, it's oh, oh she, when she's remembering it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Like, super gross. <laughs> so why is it gross? Do you want to talk about it? Well, it's just he's like, sleep with this other guy and go on, you can do it. And it's yeah, just, this, it's just, ugh. Yeah. So, well, yeah, so, and this guy is a Irish person who was raised in England and 
Hormack and Teresa Boyle are like whoring Una out to try to lure these English oriented Irish back over to the Irish side. Yeah. So they're just using her, but I mean, as we find out later, she believes she's in control. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a good, it's yeah. not a good situation. Mm -hmm. um, and so also I think there's interesting that he calls her my cold black darling from the sea. So again, her as a sea creature and her as cold, just like her vassal is cold. Mm -hmm. um, and again, he calls her my cold black ageless darling. Um, and we do find out in the section that she is 10 years older than Lyman, apparently. Mm -hmm. Which, do we know how old she is? <laughs> I don't know. Of course not. Why would they give us the actual <laughs> age? Not yet. Why is this such a mystery? <laughs> how old do you think she is? 32 to 35. <laughs> <laughs> you think Lyman's 22 to 25? Exactly. <laughs> Quick math. I'm glad I didn't get it you wrong. Know, I do think she's in her 30s at least or earliest late 20s because they keep calling her ageless which is not something you say about a young woman it's something you say about an older woman who looks young so yeah um i also think it's notable that um under the heavy eyes where the lack of sleep had stepped like a bird and this is a description of una which is also a description we get of lyman sometimes this idea that under all her beauty she's stressed out and tired um yeah. the the two of them are very similar mm -hmm. um all right so then she's dancing with the earl of ormond trying or whatever yeah earl of ormond um mm -hmm. who's this like little moron um and then tom lyman butler. what that black tom butler is the earl of ormond so <laughs> And then Lyman is kind of like they're in this dance. It's like, uh, you know, a bunch of people are going past each other and she keeps hearing the snippets of his voice. Um, and then finally he comes to her and he says a quote in French, which is, it's Balad, my little gray cat. It's Balad, death to rats, small muzzle, small teeth. Um, and- I have to come see the Dowager Queen. <laughs> Yeah, he claims that, yeah, I'm here to take her to the Dowager Queen, which of course is not uh, what he's doing. Um, and notably when she sees him, as he had foreseen, um, of all the knowing eyes that looked at him, hers alone did not change. So again, we're reminded that she knew who he was the whole time. Um, and he takes her off and we have Margaret Lennox, blank faced, sat and watched. And Teresa Boyle chases after them, but can't get to them. Mm -hmm. Wildly. Yeah. What do you think Margaret Lennox is thinking? Mm, she's mad. But I think she's mad at any woman that has Lyman's attention or that Lyman. She wishes it was her at the same time as she wants yeah. to murder. Right. She wants to murder him and she wants him to be hers at the same time. Like simultaneously. She's kind of like Robin in that. Like she wants to kill him and possess him at the same time. But you know, he does inspire that in a lot of people it's kind of understandable i mean didn't the is it didn't this book open with um everybody wants lyman or something she wanted crawford of lyman mm -hmm. yes i want him and i want to kill him she wanted crawford of lyman exactly <laughs> yep um so he takes her off and he actually is holding her arm so tight that it will be bruised the next day mm -hmm. uh, which is a little dark um but he takes That's her I was going to say it'll match her other bruises. Yeah. Una. Um, so he takes her into the chateau and into a room that he's arranged where basically nobody can get to them and it's locked. Um, and they have their, what did you call it? Meeting? <laughs> they have their meeting. <laughs> Assignation. Yes. Their tryst. Um, so she, she's thinking, first we have her thinking about how her task or Cormac had to be abandoned and she's thinking, well, she can handle Cormac and he might use his fist, but that's because he knows she's right. And it's like, she's like convinced herself that it's okay for her to be abused and that she's still in control. Yeah. Um, and they have this conversation. Um, one thing he says that's interesting is there are worse things than passing from hand to sweaty hand, much as the prospect appalls you. Um, 
does that mean I don't understand exactly why he says that but I thought maybe it was like he's implying that it would be worth it for her to get away from O'Connor and if she has to act like as a woman she has to exercise power through a man to find a better man than O'Connor where, where are you where is this uh 403 like halfway down oh yeah um and then yeah. like yeah i think he's saying find another man like there are worse things than than get, like if if you have to exercise power in this way through a man like yeah find a better one than getting a different one yeah. um and then she says that she's not tied to cormac side by fear of the future um and that basically she's saying she's with him by choice Mm -hmm. um, and he, there's this great line. He says, I think you have staked your life on Cormac O'Connor and kept, kept his young love and his young crusade green under the ice while the reality has rotted. He is not ambitious for Ireland. He is ambitious for Cormac O'Connor. He may still love your body, but he keeps you for your brain. Yeah. Um, which I think this is the big parallel between Lyman and Una because he is so afraid of selling himself to the Queen Dowager, who we know is not out for Scotland. She's out for herself. Mm -hmm. Just like Una has sold herself to O'Connor, believing that he's out for Ireland, but in fact is just out for himself. Mm -hmm. And if he was to make that decision to lock himself in with the Queen Dowager, he, he wouldn't be able to respect himself because he knows that either he would have to betray her because something for Scotland's interest was more important than hers, or he would have to betray Scotland. And he wants that independence of conscience. And she, I think because of her pride, has let go of that independence of conscience and like allowed herself to believe that this is okay because- She doesn't she, want to admit she made a mistake all those yeah. years ago when yeah. she latched onto Cormac O'Connor thinking that he would save Ireland and he's not going to save Ireland and she doesn't want to admit that she was wrong. And, and she's so far in it now. Yeah. Cause she's so far in it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I do, I, I feel bad for her. It's really, really hard to like have to recreate your life from scratch. And she really wants, she, like we, we see here is she has a great degree of compassion for the people of Ireland and she wants to help them. And so it's really scary to be like, all the stuff I've been doing to help them actually isn't going to help them. Right. And it's sort of like, there's a, I could imagine that there would be a comfort in I'm enduring all these horrible things, but the end result of that endurance is going to be of benefit to my people. But if she actually acknowledges the fact that all of that endurance was for nothing, then like I can see where she can't like she cannot let that thought come that this has been for nothing and that I have allowed all of these horrible things to be done to me and my vision will not be realized like mm. yeah yeah it's awful um I agree that's probably and she's done horrible things like not only has she allowed horrible things to happen to her she has done horrible things and what does that do? Like, if as a person you have to come face to face with, like, I made these horrible choices and hurt most likely many, many people thinking I had a higher goal and I was justified in my ends. Like, the means justify the ends, but if the ends are not good, the means are not justified. So. Exactly. Um, so she has a wonderful line after that where she says, and what would you keep me for? The graveyards and prisons of Europe are full enough of half-made souls created by Francis Crawford and loneliness and God. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, he says he's offering her a chance to define and, refi and revise your ideals. Um, is it impossible that they should choir with mine? Meaning... Mm -hmm. um, they actually, I think, and he sees it, they do have a lot in common. They do care about the people of their countries. Um, and he's trying to find that common connection with her. Um, and I think this is part of why he, he likes and admires her, um, because he sees the good in her, um, the, the, the potential in there. 
Yeah, and I love her reply. Like, it's a lavish offer if a trifle obscure. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> what do you mean, Betty? <laughs> like, mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Um, so we also just get, they have the little discussion that reveals that, uh, you know, as we kind of knew, she allowed the tour to minimate to happen, but she did save Lyman. Um, and that George Douglas is the one that told Albany that Lyman was coming to France. Mm -hmm. Oh, George. Oh, George. George. Always scheming. George. Um, and we also learned that she figured out right away uh, that Lyman was Taddy Boy because of a slight accent issue uh, that like was very hard to notice, but she noticed it. Right. Which we kind of, like, that kind of came up in that initial conversation with the her aunt and her, and it was like all that language stuff was happening, and it was, yeah, I mean, it was there. it was definitely clear that she knew he was Lyman because she yeah. made like from the comments she made. Mm -hmm. Um, so we know how she found out now, and also she admits that she continued to let Domini think that Liam Rowe was Lyman and didn't reveal the real Lyman, um, presumably because it helps get rid of one of Cormac's rivals. Mm -hmm. Although she did say that she, like, gives me credit for since I discovered long ago that uh, Philoma Liamro is no, was no rival that Cormac need fear. So, like, she knew almost from the beginning that Liamro wasn't going to be a threat to Cormac, and yet she still allowed Diabni to think he was Lyman. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he asks her for the, the na one name of a conspirator that worked with Daubeny, such as the person that tied the rope at the short of Minime. Mm -hmm. um, and we have her thinking also, um, and we learn the reason for his serenade when he was Taddy Boy, and he interrupted her in Oleum Row. It was, of course, not to thwart Oleum Row. It was to disrupt a communication she was trying to make with Daubeny about the deal with Cormac. Mm -hmm. um, and this is also the reason that Lyman grabbed Robin Stewart for the rooftop race because Robin Stewart was the messenger in this whole thing. So that yeah. whole scene, if you go back and read it, is completely different than what we think it was because the whole thing is presented as just Lyman is super wasted and making a mess of everything. But in fact, everything he did was quite calculated. And he was still wasted. Oh, he was heavily wasted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was still wasted think. and being super dramatic about it all. But he was also doing important spy work, okay? Saving sure. the world. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was, I was, it makes sense now, the whole serenade scene, because I still couldn't fathom why he would have pulled that at that specific moment. Yeah. Like, what was, what was in it for him? Why? So to get an answer to that question, I was like, oh. Okay. And also, it didn't make sense why she was so mad about it. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, yes, it was kind of humiliating, and yes, it was public, and you know that. But I, but I sort of felt that her emotional response to that was way out of proportion to the the crime, you know. And but then you find out, like, oh, that was there was something else going on. Yeah. And and her knowing who she is, she probably knew that he was disrupting her on purpose. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um. So having tried a whole bunch of uh, these arguments, it's not working. So he tries sentiment um, and brings up that Mary is eight years old. Um, well, and this is- But also it's important to say like, he's super explicit about it. Like it's not, he's, he's sort of, she's like, there's nothing I can do. The whole width of the room lay between them. There was no sound. Then Lyman said calmly, let us try a little sentiment then. So it's like, it's like he's being like, okay, that argument didn't work for you. So let me try this argument for you. Like, it's, it's like he's trying to, man he's manipulating her, but he's just saying like, he's being very, very concrete and explicit about this. <laughs> so it's- Well, he, because he, I think because he knows that she knows what he's doing yeah. and he's, he's not gonna, he's not gonna condescend to her intelligence. Yeah. Right. Which he, is he's meeting her on even ground. Yeah. yeah. He's like, okay, that didn't work. Let's try this other thing. <laughs> Um, so then they have this interesting conversation, and this is where, you know, he says she's eight years old, and then Una says, um, you know, she's got this great chest for her jewels, the jewel of an Irish child is a handful of meal. Mm -hmm. um, so what she cares about is is saving the children of Ireland, but then he kind of like deconstructs her argument and is like, well, if the things that you want come to pass, what's actually going to happen is 
um, uh, probably war, which is going to kill lots of Scottish people, but also war uh, caused by Cormac is going to kill lots of Irish people. So really, in your plot, lots of children are still going to die. So how is it any better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and also interesting that he asked her, can you look no further than one nation and one man? So even though he, he's made that argument for patriotism, he doesn't, he's not only thinking of patriotism around one nation, he's thinking about the good of humanity regardless of borders, mm -hmm. um, which is like obviously a super progressive idea for the Renaissance when just the patriotism of the nation was kind of progressive. Yeah. Um, but I love that Lyman cares. I was in a plug for Liam Rowe. He's like, he's like, there's already a man half awake in Liam Rowe. It's like, can't you just dump, dump Carmack and Cormac and like go get Liam Rowe? He, he's really almost there. Like you almost got him. You know. I have to say I agree with it. Yeah, me too. Uh, and he would um, treat her so much better. Like so much yeah. better. He would be like he would respect her brain and like listen to her and ah yeah. yeah um but she is still not having it and she's still sticking with Cormac um and she's thinking his moderation was a debt he owed to other women not to her and eventually it would break so I think she's thinking you know he's going to start trying to like get violent and she needs to ward him off and she's not going to change his mind. So she's going to have to seduce him. And she's thinking like, Oh God, how cold is he? How hard is this going to be to seduce this guy? Um, not at all. <laughs> but then surprise, he seduces her instead. Yeah. Well, there's this also this bit where she's super condescending about the sex where she's like, I'm going to have to teach him. Like I'm going to give him this, experience and you know da, 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 and yet he just breaks her in it well i think that she i mean i don't think she's wrong in the, in what she expects which is i'm 10 years older than you i'm very experienced you think you're gonna seduce me just wait i'm gonna show you that what is it you have no none of this coin to barter with me um so turns out i mean i would assume like having spent so much time with all of these prostitutes that he's so friendly with he's gotten very good instructions on how to please a lady uh he's really that's good at it thing, that's not the thing that gets to her though it's not the good sex like although that seems to be implied that that does happen <laughs> like that he is good at sex but it's the connection that causes her is it really the connection though because it says that they were strangers to each other and they were both kind of having sex with an illusion of what the other one was yeah, but it was the like the emotion that happens. So something he was doing that was beyond physical pleasure. Is I think I don't think he was so good at sex that he caused her to cry. <laughs> like this just seems ridiculous. <laughs> like something else is going on. Well, what do you think was going on? Uh, okay, so to be completely honest, I had to read this part of the section in like 10 minutes. So I had to read it really fast. Um, but this, okay, so there's this bit where he says, um, within the boy's frame and the armored violence of her soul came a response stronger than her will. A surge of triumph so great that she would have stopped him if she had been strong enough in that moment before glory could be dimmed. Then she was held fast in sudden turbulence as if suddenly leashed, as if an iron door had closed on a fire. So, so we get this like metaphor about the sex that they're having. Um, he spoke in the end, lifting his lips from hers, but she did not hear. So it's like something's going on with her. Uh, he says, when she came to herself, she found him kneeling and her self taunt in his hands. My dear, you're weeping, he said. And this whole bit, uh, welcome to the company of those who can be hurt, you know? And so on one hand, you can read it like, yeah, he gave her an orgasm so great that she passed out. But I don't think that's actually what happened. Like that, that there was some sort of like him seeing to her needs physically. Like, I mean, you can't imagine that anyone else that she's had sex with has cared about her experience that much like Cormac certainly doesn't and I'm guessing that the people that he's 
sort of required her to seduce haven't cared about her pleasure and her experience at all and yet that's what Lyman does so yeah it's about the sex and the fact that he gives her like a really good sexual experience but I think it's more about the fact that he sees her and cares about her experience and that that kind of breaks her a little bit emotionally so the I mean I agree but it's not through words it is through sex it's just through pleasing her right no um, making everything about her that. It's not about him convincing her with words. It's just, it's not, I, I guess I should say, it's not about the fact that they had sex. Like, that's not what did it. It's the fact that he cared about her experience when they had sex. Like, yeah. So the whole metaphor here is of her, she's ice and cold. And then the metaphor is of the warmth. Um, she says, my heart is scalded. Um, and then we hear the warmth from him was like the smell of a meal on a frosty day at the end of a hard ride. He said, yours is not to lead now. We go side by side, rest from your travels. Yeah. Um, and then everything in here is this basically her coldness melting into warmth that he brings by, like you're saying, like having this connection and, yeah. uh, and making her feel. Like, let's have a sexual experience where you can rest. Like, like because she, really different yeah because she has to be in charge all the time yeah. she's yeah um so okay so also on that ice metaphor we have her grimly icily um coming into this like she's going into battle um and I can't say that I think she's crazy for expecting uh, him to not be as good at sex as her because she's been sent on all these missions with all these young men. And I mean, we've seen how selfish all of these young men of the French court are. Um, so she's expecting to you know, blow him out of the water. Um, she's thinking of him as a conceited trifler. But actually, you know, as we find out, he... Um, is very generous of soul and very experienced of body and uh, gives her a completely different experience. Um, I also thought there was an interesting note in here where um, we're in Una's point of view and it says she had almost loved a Liam Rowe for his innocence. So you remember when he asked, do you like me or do you love me at all? Um, I, when I first read that, I was thinking he, she doesn't love you, but then we find out she almost did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he was just such a different, like, he's such a contrast to Cormac, and, like, even just the way he treated Laudis was, you know, such a contrast to, yeah. To like, Cormac. all of them. He's such a good person in a world full of really selfish, boring people. Um, so, also, um, I think it's an interesting parallel in the scene with Robin Stewart. Like Philippe was saying at the beginning, we have these two meetings, um, but in both of them, the person breaks down weeping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously for very different reasons. Um, and I think it's interesting also, um, Lyman in this scene. Um, there's a few indications here of what's going on with him. Uh, one of them is on 408, Lyman asserting his full powers she had never met at close quarters before. Um, and then um, she had met a strength steady and firm, easy in its ways and controlled. Um, controlled as any other instrument he used, his hand subtle on the keys. So he is turning his powers on her with a high degree of control. So this is not like a passionate, you know, I can't stop myself from taking years. You're so beautiful. This is a very intentional um, seduction, basically, um, which parallels with, I think, a couple of things. One is um, this idea of him as the puppet master manipulating the situation. This is another situation he's creating and constructing in order to get what he wants, just like he manipulated and constructed that whole scene with Robin Stewart. Um, and I think it also parallels the scene with Martine where he set himself to please her. 
um, and he pleases her in exchange for information. Um, so he is using sex as a way to, it's just another tool in his tool belt, basically. Like his, he was abstractedly exercising his charm in the inn. And another skill that he's apparently amazing at. So on top of all the other things we've learned about him. I mean, the instrument metaphors are interesting oh, you know, because, of, because of the skill and practice involved in playing an instrument well, you know, and so that's just like Taddy Boy, you know, enthralls the court with his music. It's kind of the same, that same idea Actually. here. Yeah, that yeah. he plays, he plays her body like an instrument. Um, and I think it's, so they have this lovely night, um, and, and for Una, certainly, this is a really transformative experience for her. Um, you know, we have her weeping, her who's this cold, cold person. Mm -hmm. um, for one person only, the music stayed all night long, losing no magnificence, demanding more sometimes than she could support. Um, and she knew neither where she was nor whom she was with, for Lyman had given her the greatest gift in his possession. For one night, he had severed Una O'Dwyer's soul from her mind. For one single night, she was free. Mm -hmm. So we have that, and then we also have, it was the first time and the last. They did not know each other when it began, and when it was over, they knew nothing still, for they embraced visions and not flesh, his eyes lifted considering to wider horizons and her soul, a stranger to warm earth and harvests bent on snatching its hour. Um, there's so much interesting in that. Um, the idea that she didn't know who she was with. So again, this isn't a love connection between the two of them. It's her, um, it's her, it's more her just having this experience of someone caring for her it, 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 think of it as like a going back to Sleep No More, which I know most of you haven't seen, was a theater show where people, characters can actually touch the audience. The emotional reaction you have by being touched by an, a character is like a there's something very visceral about being touched by another human being that transcends like the typical boundaries of theater. It creates a physical and emotional reaction um, that's just like a natural aspect of humanity that when someone touches you, your body and your mind like responds in a particular way. So she, even though he's, it's not love, but it's still her having this intense reaction. It's not about who he is. It's about what she's experiencing. Right. And I think the comparison to Sleep No More is interesting because like it, the connection still exists, even though as an audience member, I know that the person touching me is a character, like is being played by an actor who isn't, like, I don't know that person and I don't know, they're playing a character and I know they're playing a character. And yet that still, that connection is still real. And so like, obviously to a very different level, but in this scene, like Una, the fact that she knows that Lyman is trying to, like she has no illusions over the fact that he's trying to convince her to give him the information he needs. He's got a goal through all of this. She's well aware of that, but it doesn't change the fact that that connection still, like she still finds that incredibly transformative experience in the midst of that. Um, also, um, this isn't, or this is the, it was the first time and the last. What does that tell you? I well, mean, I it as it is like this is the first time they're together and it's the last time they're going to be together i don't think they'll ever sort of do they, they'll meet together again but i don't think that they'll ever have a, a moment like this so unless our narrator is not believable like yeah are we when we see that like i don't see that particular section they did not know each other when it began it was over they knew nothing still for they like that whole thing like that doesn't seem to be in una's point of view or lyman's point of view it seems to be we're in a third person narrator at that point so if the narrator's believable then this is it for them like they're not they're not going to have a relationship going forward which i'm fine with mm -hmm. not for anything i mean i think i've come around to I'm still not fond of Una, but I, I think I understand her a little bit better. 
but um, I definitely do not think she and Lyman would be like, what would be the point of that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like other than the fact that they're both interesting people and could probably keep each other interested, but in terms of their goals, neither of them would help each other actually accomplish what they want in life or anything, so. It made me wonder a bit if Una is not long for this world, like if something bad is coming her way till the end of the book, because that could be one of the reasons it was their last time. I was not thinking that, but now I am. Oh. Mm. I hope not. I hope not too, but- I'm here to like get with the Lemro and then they can go save Ireland. We're, we're getting to- That will happen, but- So, you know people die. Yeah. Oh, I mean, she is not a historical character, correct? She is, she's made up for the story. Okay, so she doesn't have to die at the same time that his, her historical cow, counterpart did. So she's got that going for her, at least. So, but I don't know. I really do want her and Liam Road to, like, go save Ireland. And I know that's not going to happen, because Ireland doesn't get saved. <laughs> for Ireland. But, you know? But um, that's what I want, you know? I totally ship the two of them. Yeah. They're so sweet. Um, what, do, what do you make of, so they both embraced visions and not flesh. He doesn't really see the true Una either, but it says his eyes lifted considering to wider horizons. What does that mean? <laughs> More than this? I don't know. <laughs> like I think he's... he's something beyond here like more than her and there's I don't know there's more out there he's not I, don't know, he's well, not he, he, I guess it's part of like I think it's part of his whole he's doing all of this for the greater good of Scotland he's moving pieces on a chessboard on this whole political playground and um, it, it, even though he is there with her in the moment his mind is on more I mean, one question I have is that, like, finding finding a partner in life, like a a woman in this day and age, for the most part, does not seem to be a big goal for him. Like, that's not that doesn't seem to be something that he's working towards or dreaming about or, you know, analyzing the women in his life to see which one was like that doesn't seem to be a thing that's happening with him. So I find that interesting like he obviously deeply cares about his family but he doesn't seem to be focused on having his own so why do you think that is i mean i don't i don't know i i mean i think there's lots of reasons for it that we've seen you know the the trauma he's gone through the like whether he thinks he has something to give someone you know whether he thinks he's worthy of of doing that. Um, he doesn't want anyone to sacrifice themselves for him. So I can see like him saying, well, I can't have anyone in my life because then they will be a target, you know, like that kind of thing. So there could be all, there could be lot, myriad, myriad reasons. No, <laughs> I but. think it's all that, but I think it's also, he hasn't established himself. So yeah. he doesn't, he doesn't know who he's going to be. He's still trying to, he, he cares so much about the greater picture of the world and wanting to make a positive impact on it. So his, his focus is on his sort of grand visions and it's not on the personal and the immediate. Mm -hmm. um, so then they wake up and she wakes up with him watching her and he smiles, uh, a brilliant fleeting smile of mischief and friendship. Mm -hmm. um, mischief and friendship, but not love, I think which is notable. He has not fallen in love with her. Um, but his, his brilliant smile is just like so adorable still. Um, I love that it's mischief and friendship. It's like, it's like friendship, but it's also this like, let's go do something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's very cute. And, but then, um, so she has a thought he had, he had gave her, he gave her the price of her secret 20 times over. Um, but still she won't tell him, mm -hmm. um, and it says, you know, being what she was, she must fling it back in his face. Why does she think that? What does it mean, being what she was? Well, does she suffer from the same thing that Lyman suffers from, which is 
they don't have a great self image, you know? And so I, I think there's this, this lie that we often tell ourselves that like, I'm this kind of person and I can't change. So I might as well embrace it, you know? And so she's like, well, I'm, this is who I am. This is, it's like that phrase, you know, I've made my bed, so I have to lie in it, you mm -hmm. know? So she's like, this is the path my life has chosen. So I have to just go with it. And even though this guy was super persuasive and this was an amazing experience, like that doesn't change the fact that I'm still this person, you know, maybe. She's very fatalistic. So then we have this amazing line. Um, he says, I have failed then, I thought so. And then she says, we are both traitors in snow. It is our kind, Francis. Uh, and then it says his mother has used, had used these words to her once. She did not tell him, nor did she tell him the other thing he did not know. Um, first of all, I just love this line. Um, we are both traitors in snow. What do, what do you think that means? Well, it's ephemeral. Mm, very fleeting. Yeah, it's like we're, we're dealing with something that will melt away and go to nothing. And then I just put three question marks off to the side of this. It's like, what the hell doesn't he know? Like, and why does she know it, you know? So. Um, I think maybe the thing he doesn't know is just the name of the co-conspirator, but it's in this weird position right after his thing about his mother that yeah. sort of hints that maybe she knows something related to that. It's, I right. don't think it's entirely clear. Yeah. I, um, I thought it was something related to his mother. Like, I don't know. And we can wonder when did she meet his mother and why didn't we know about this? Um, best guess being when Richard went to find a wife, maybe Richard and Sevilla went to Ireland to find mm -hmm. Marietta and that's where they met since she's, I think Marietta's distant relative or, or Liam Rose a distant relative or something. Anyway, she and Sevilla met in Ireland. Yeah. Sevilla knows everybody. I'll <laughs> <laughs> um, think with the, with the traders in snow line, it's also the traders line is important. This is trade. Mm -hmm. um, and then here is where she says that she will uh, sell him her information in exchange for 5,000 Frenchmen out of Scotland. Um, and he responds, um, not quite in his usual register. And if I discredit you and Cormac by just exposing Daubeny, who will lead your wonderful army? I think the not quite in his usual register is that he hates having to make a threat. Um, and he, it's really not what he's there for. And especially after he slept with her. So he does it, but he hates doing it. And that's why his voice sounds weird. I don't know if you have a different interpretation on that. Mm -hmm. no, I agree. Yeah. Um, I think there's also just this interesting thing about Lyman is that he's this person who's kind of forced to be someone he's not mm -hmm. um like he's not the kind of person that's gonna sleep with a woman and then threaten her um but because of the situation he's in and the political games and the spying and the manipulating he's he's feels that he has to do it and so he's doing it but it's like mm -hmm. it's like selling his soul in a way it's something he's not comfortable with and not happy about um which is part of what's so interesting about him yeah i love the i love this bit where he's like she he's he threatens her and then she responds they kind of have this back and forth a little bit and then she's getting agitated she's like <laughs> she's like oh like our moment is over now we're back to this like bartering and all of that and and then he just says be still be still he, he said that like this idea of like her resting and being still like that's it continues to be part of the scene and then uh he's like i can't do that and then he says sharply she turned her head and caught the wry amusement still in his eyes he did not hide it stop tormenting the morning 
I love that line. Stop tormenting the morning. Lie with me and be still, he said. My bed is not a marketplace, whatever you may think. I had nothing ever but a little self-knowledge to offer you. If you will not tell me for that, I have nothing more I can sell. And so that, that I think sort of kind of speaks to the part that what he was offering her that was different, it wasn't having sex with her. It was the way that it was like what he was able to bring to her through that and reveal to her. And this, I think this pushes back a little bit on like, if he's being honest in this moment, it's like he didn't perceive this as like him being a whore in this situation, like in selling his, selling the sex, like that's not what it was. It was about helping her realize something about herself and, and that that was valuable. I think it's super interesting because he, what he gives her is this idea maybe that there's another possibility out there from all these men who are only out for themselves and are violent and don't care about her saying like there's some you know step out of this like miserable little bubble you're in and see that you deserve better and that there are people out there that will treat you better um but i think he also has some blind spots um one of them which we get from margaret erskine's reaction <laughs> is like how do you think Una's, Una's not going to start fixating on, oh, some other man out there. She's going to be fixating on you, you idiot. Yeah. Um, but then also he says, my bed is not a marketplace, mm -hmm. but I think that this is wishful thinking. I think that's what he wants. He wants yeah. it not to be a marketplace. He wants this to have been a genuine exchange of their friendship, but they have been bartering the entire time. <laughs> Yeah, but I wonder if what he's saying, like, they've been bartering. And, like, I think, like, Una came to this situation with, sorry, stupid people who don't put mufflers on their motorcycles. Um, like, Una came to this situation with a very clear intention of, like, seducing him for gain, you know, like, she's gonna as has been her habit and as Cormac has made her do like trade her body for things but I'm not sure that I'm not sure that Lyman came at this with the same like I think his attitude was different than hers it was more about like he wanted something from her as well but I think the whole thing was more than that. It was more concerned with her, her benefit in this whole situation in ways that she was not concerned with his benefit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but. for sure. I, I agree on that. Um, but it's, it's somewhere between a transaction and a genuine connection because he's yeah. still doing it for her, not in a it's not a reciprocal thing right yeah for sure as you get um, the whole thing about him playing an instrument and all that like she's not playing <laughs> like yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's a constructed situation that he's controlling even though he has like you said good intentions for her okay. um and then she weeps again, um, and he lent her his comfort for, like Lewidus, she had been pitched against something too fierce for her race. Um, so I feel, I feel bad for her, because even after she's saying, no, I'm not going to give you what you want, she's weeping in his arms again. Um, so then he does this totally nutty move of <laughs> taking her for this walk of shame to marry Queen of Scots. <laughs> In their in their clothes from the night what? before. Yeah. Um, so he can get in because he's working for the Queen Dowager and he's the one like taking care of the Queen's safety and Margaret Erskine is his friend and so and she's one of the people there, so they go in. Um, and Margaret's reaction is quite interesting. She uh, she hides her exasperation yeah. and thinks, You fools, why do you let him? I know. Another Another lesson, another experiment, another flawed vessel that would break. Yeah. She's just like, why do you guys keep letting him do this? 
Brian? I do um, like her. <laughs> I also think that she's thinking about Christian here. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And and probably at the end also. Yeah. Um, so then Una and Mary have this amazing conversation that Lyman sets up where Lyman is completely honest and is like, yeah, you know, she's an Irish patriot and she wants your Frenchman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she hold even your life cheap and they debate, um, you know, Una debates the eight-year-old Mary Queen of Scots mm -hmm. um, about, you know, why don't you give me the 5,000 Frenchmen? And we see that... Um, first of all, Mary is like super spirited and very likable, um, but also that like she's very right about the position, the precariousness of her own position um, yeah. and the fact like it suddenly is real in a way maybe it hadn't been before that this little girl has been like her entire life, people have been chasing after her to get her, you know, with violence and the only thing keeping her safe is this al alliance with France. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, lo I love that this scene concluded with her taking out a knife and being like i'll stab you you know and it's just such a it's such a visceral example of how precarious her situation is that they've given a weapon to this little girl in the vain hope that if somebody gets to her like there's no way she's gonna be able to overpower you know a grown assassin or something but you gotta try, you know, <laughs> and just that she yeah. knows that. And uh, yeah. and how scary it must be for her as a little girl yeah. to have been given this knife and told you may right. have to defend yourself against a murderer. Yeah, right, and then she's, and then she's so like, try to stab me, go on, I'll kill you all dead. <laughs> like, oh, you poor thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then um, also, I think, um, again, she's very right uh, and, what Lyman ends up describing it as is if they were to take the soldiers out of Scotland and send them to Ireland, it would be robbing a seawall to build a buyer. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Una has this idea, but it's totally unrealistic. Yeah. Uh, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna help. It's just gonna get Scotland into a bad position just like Ireland is. Right. Yeah. Um, and then there's this sort of wonderful bit at the end um, where Una says, save your steel for those you trust. They are the ones who will carry your beer, the men who cannot hate, nor can they know love. Send away the cold servants. So she's obviously thinking of Lyman here, I think. Um, and then Mary says, I would, but I do not know any. And anxiously demonstrating her point, she caught Lyman by the hand. So she, she trusts him and she loves him and she doesn't think of him as cold. And so she grabs him and holds his hand um, and then Una like bursts out with the sound that could be a cry, a sob, or a laugh, and and like runs away basically. Um, which is so adorable. And then it turns out that um, because Mary was holding the knife, when she grabbed his hand, she <laughs> cut him. Cut him. <laughs> yeah. What I love is like, was it necessary, my queen, to, <laughs> to cut me? <laughs> and she's like, oh, no. prove me warm-blooded on the spot. <laughs> I wonder a little bit though in that line that line where so when Una speaks and she says her throat dry Una spoke save your steel for those you trust like it seems like she was saying the ones you'll have to stab are the ones you trust like the people who will betray you are the people you trust and that's who actually like you're actually vulnerable to the people you trust which says something about Una. I mean, it's both true and says something about Una. Yeah, it maybe says more about Una than about the position Mary's in. Yeah. Um, and also I think Una's perception of Lyman as this cold person who doesn't hate or love. Um, and then Mary's perception being completely different is interesting. I think obviously we know that Mary is right in this situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and then Margaret, so angry that she sends Lyman out with, with his wound not being dressed and tells him, go away and bleed to death on behalf of the female sex. I may, I feel I may cheer every lesion. Um, I, don't, I don't know. She, I think read that a little bit is like, she's like, oh, go away and bleed to death. Like on the behalf of all women, like I'm going to cheer every lesion. I kind of got it as her just like being 
oh, Lyman, stop doing this. And like, cause he's clearly not wounded very much. Like he's just, like, it's no big yeah. deal. So. But she is really angry. Like she grabs a vase and throws it to the ground and shatters it. Yeah. Yeah. The most, yeah. She just, she is. But I think she's, like, I don't think she's angry. I think she's angry because she likes him. It's like, she just, not, not in a, not in a like, 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 she's just, she wants him to be better than he is. And she wants him to be like different with women than he is. And so she's just like, oh, go away and bleed to death. You know, and then smashes the base on the floor. And but, I assume part of her exasperation is because he's bringing this woman that as far as she knows, he doesn't know or trust yeah. in to be the queen. Like, what are you doing in here with this random stranger? And I don't know if Margaret Erskine thinks Una is a stranger, but she at least knows enough to know probably not to trust her, so. Yeah, I did like uh, she's like super exasperated and just like, ah! Mm -hmm. But I think her exasperation is on Una's behalf because she says on behalf of the female sex. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think in part she's thinking of Christian again. She grew up with Christian. Um, Christian died trying to help Lyman. Yeah. I think that she sees something in Una that makes her think that Una is another Christian potentially. Um, what do you think she's worried about here that has made her so upset? I think it's just a pattern with Lyman that she's, and I don't know, I think you're totally right that it's more about Christian than it is about Una. I'm not sure she actually cares about Una, like other than just we're both women, like, I'm, but Lyman, the women in Lyman's life don't seem to fare well like, mm -hmm. in, in lots of ways. Yeah. So I think that Margaret is like, she knows that and thinks he could be better and he's not. So. Do you think what he did with Una was bad? Well, from her perspective, she doesn't know. Like from Margaret's perspective, all she sees is two people who've clearly had, like, have come in from having sex because they're in the clothes that they were in the night before and they're wandering around the palace and they come into the queen in their, you know, finery from last night and that, that, that's all she sees. She doesn't, so yeah, that's super bad. <laughs> yeah. I think also, I mean, I think it tells us something that Dunnett ends the chapter on this note and that Margaret is such a generally such a perceptive person mm -hmm. um, that there is the potential indication here of Lyman as this, we keep having this motif of him as this careless puppet master that, mm -hmm. you know, it risks his puppets. Uh, we have that with Robin and now maybe she's seeing that risk with Una also. And I do think that like, like I was saying before, the idea of showing her this amazing night to get her to see that there's more, you know, there could be people in the world that treat her better. That mm -hmm. is going to backfire. That never, it's, I don't know. But yeah. I don't and think also, that, I think he has a blind spot there. Margaret could also be mad about the queen. Like, like in addition to, I mean, she's also, like, I'm not sure I would call the queen a woman. She's a kid, but, but like, on behalf of the women that, like, Lyman just seems to like blow through everybody's life and not, not seem to care about the consequences. And here she is sort of a, she's not the governess or the nursemaid to the queen, but she's one of the women who looks after this little girl. And then this guy like blows into the room <laughs> with this woman. And he's at, like, and she just, of course she's mad. Like that's idiotic behavior. Like you should not be doing that. So, yeah. Um, any other commentary on this chapter? It was a good chapter. Yeah, a lot happened. Yeah. Did it did it change your expectations of or hopes of what's going to happen later in the in the book or the series? I don't think so. I still think Dobney's going to be exposed. I don't know if it's going to come because of Robin Stewart or because of Una, or as a, because of a combination of what he gains from both of them. I hope it comes because of Robin. I like, do. I 
I feel like my hopes for Robin to do something sort of like redemptive are a little bit, str I kind of, they were kind of dashed up until this last chapter. And I feel like in this last chapter, maybe I have a little, a little bit more hope that he's not going to just get like captured and executed or something. Um, I hope that Una does help them out. I hope that she gets away from Cormac. Like I hope that she rescues herself and not that, I hope that she gets away from Cormac and I hope that she does it herself. And that it's not like that somebody doesn't just kill him or something. Um, I'd like that to be an active choice on her part, which I think because it speaks to Oliam Rose clear understanding that you can't rescue someone who doesn't want to be rescued. So she has to save herself. What do you think? How do you think this whole motif of Lyman as the puppet master is going to play out? Well, I kind of hope not well. Like, it's not, like, I don't want my hero to be, like, yeah, super manipulative. a manipulative bastard, you know? So, hopefully we'll have a victory, but that it won't be because he masterfully manipulated everybody into doing what he wants. Like, let's... Um, how do you think his relationship with Una is going to play out? I don't know how Fleet Philem Liam Rowe is going to react to the truth if he ever finds out the truth. I mean, I do know it's not going to be good. He's already very angry at mm -hmm. Lyman for the way he casually uses people and sort of moves on to the next. I don't necessarily think they're going to have a relationship. Like, I mean, obviously they'll interact more, but. I'm not expecting them to have like, you know, some sort of deep moments or, you know, <laughs> like, I kind of feel like they had their moment. This is, this was the moment. <laughs> so. Um, any other hopes and dreams for the, the rest of the series now or sorry, the rest or the rest of the book? I mean, there's only three chapters to go, so it's got to wrap up. Really? We've only got yeah. three chapters left. Yeah, Maybe what's gonna happen? Uh, I don't know if if she if done it will do cliffhangers into the next book or anything like that. So we'll see. Maybe I hope not. I hope it's I hope not. I don't like cliffhangers. I don't um, even know we'll start the next book immediately. Yeah, <laughs> I just don't like cliffhangers. <laughs> but all right, well, not a lot of time left, so uh, we will see you all uh, next time with the uh, the next two chapters. All right. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.